Randy Varsala. Let's do business for God. Let me read from Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Let me say it like this. Now faith. What kind of faith? Now faith. See the difference. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. That's one way to say it. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. I heard one guy say it like this. He said, what would God say if you asked him, what, what time is it? And the answer would be, see, the, excuse me, the answer would be, it's right now. What time is it? Right now. What time is it? It's right now. Well, Brother Randy, how can you say that? Well, remember I just read, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Lord, what time is it? It is. Lord, what time is it? It's right now. See how you can qualify that? Both uh, explanations speak to each other. What time is it? It's right now. Brother Randy, what kind of faith is that? That's now faith. Now faith says now. It doesn't say God's fixing to. Uh, I'm going to. All of these uh, putting it off isms. If you want to talk about faith and now faith, that's what we're doing. You know, this is not, when we talk about faith on this level here, this is not kindergarten stuff. This is, I'm going to have to say, this is for the serious student. You want to talk about now faith? Well, then we'll talk about now faith. You know, when you're believing God for something, you're, you're believing God for it now. I hear so many people in their words and in their confession, they're saying, well, you know, and these are some of these people that I'm talking about. These are really seasoned people. They've been hanging around with God for decades. And I still hear it falling out of their face. Well, you know, you know, God's going to do this for me. God's going to... And I've had to rebuke people right to their face and say, Look, if you don't stop saying that, you're going to be saying that the next time I see you. And you're not going to be walking in what you desire to be walking in because you won't change your words. You have to use your words, just like it says in James, like the, the rudder of a ship. You turn that rudder... And that ship will respond. This, a lot of this is coming back, or maybe I could say all of this is coming back to now faith. Help me, Jesus, to preach this, teach this strong. To drive this in like a nail in oak. Come on, come on. For those of you that don't understand that, when you drive a nail into oak, it's been my experience, if you ever want to pull that nail out, you will break the nail. It will not come back out of the oak. That's how strong oak is. Seen it lots of times. Help me, Jesus, to get this into your people. Strong. Irremovable. So those of you that are not watching your words or watching your confession, when you hear me talking about this stuff, judge yourself. Tune yourself up. Watch your words. When we started into the things of faith, we learned that if you don't watch your words, you will not walk in what you are desiring to walk in. And the more we watched our words, the more it came to pass. The more we saw things develop in the positive. And I can tell you this. I can actually remember the time when the Lord spoke to me, just going throughout my, my day one day. And the Lord spoke to me, and 
I had been working on my confession for years. I had been working on, oh, you know, yeah. as a metal worker, you will take tools and you will make that metal be what you want it to be. You might take a grinder and put a new edge on it. You might take an edge off. You might take a file and change the, the shape of the thing. And it's sort of like that with words, using your tongue, your speech. If you will order your words, you have to make the conscious choice to do that. And you have to, you have to make a quality decision with this stuff. You don't get excited about it at a meeting at 2 o'clock. And then, uh, you know, by 6.30 that night, it's already starting to melt away. You have to make a quality decision in these things to go this way. This can be done. I was sitting in a congregation one day and the pastor, the pastor actually said this. I was embarrassed, but you know, the word says that God will bless you so such in such a large fashion, so big time. He'll bless you so much, he'll embarrass you. And this is one of those instances. And this pastor, he was going along yakking away about something and he talked about confession. And he stopped and he looked over at me. He didn't, he didn't name me. But he stopped and he looked over at me and he said, you know, the person that I know with the tightest confession of any human being on the face of the earth is sitting right in this room right now. Now, I had learned to do what I just explained to you right there. I had learned that I would rather... No, that's... that's, that's see, there's a, don't get suckered into a bad confession. Well, I just made up my mind. I'm just not going to be running around making stupid confessions. Worthless, full of air, nothingness, worthless. And it paid off. Now, I said that to say this. I was going through my day one day. And, you know, sort of unannounced the Holy Spirit. I believe it was, I believe it was Father God manifesting through the Holy Spirit. I sensed the, 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 the presence and the personality of the Father God. And he so to speak, he stopped me in my day. Like you would say, push pause. He pushed pause on me. I got quiet. I got really attentive with my ears. And when he had my attention, he said to me, He said to me, you've been watching your words and that's good. I want you to know this. I have turned up the power on your words, my son. You are watching your words. And I'm tipping you off to this, that I have turned the level up. And the level that you will now operate in concerning words and things coming to pass I have upgraded you. You are not as you were 15 minutes ago. When he showed up, there was a presence of God that showed up on me. And best way I know how to say it is, I knew that what he had just said to me, it had been installed like a, like a, a module or a chip. That the power of my words, they had gone much higher than they were before. So, I already knew this about watching my words, but I knew when God shows up and tells you that, you know, that's, that, that's a big thing. And I knew, said to myself, buddy boy, you've been watching your words before, but he has just tipped me off, tipped us off that he's turned the power up. So we're going to watch our words more than I ever have before. I had a, an enhanced level of respect for my words and the power of the spoken word. And we've learned that, you know, we have an inner ear and an outer ear. And uh, somebody, I heard it explained like this. He said this. He said, that outer ear, he explained the reason of that, the purpose of that. But he said, but your inner ear, he said, that inner ear, 
The only reason that we can come up with why that's there is that so that you can hear your own speech. That's why the, the inner ear exists. So that when you speak, you can hear the most important voice on the earth for dictating your life and arranging your confession coming out of your mouth. Your ears heard it. It went down into your spirit in the mind of your it went into the mind of your soul and into the mind of your spirit by your spoken word. Praise God. That's good preaching, people. If you if you've never heard that before, that's that's excellent stuff. That's the Holy Ghost right there. Hmm. Hmm. I just realized this now. The, 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 I was talking about hearing and all that. And this morning, oh, probably uh, eight hours ago, I guess, the Lord had me in my notes. He had me write this down. Those that have ears to hear. For those that have ears to hear. Think about that in relation to what I just said. For those that have ears to hear. Excuse me. God bless the people. I say, I'm not, oh, you know, God bless America. God bless, <coughs> God bless everything. I'm not saying that like that. I'm saying this now deliberately. You know, this is like, like a sniper. He picks out a, a spot, a target, and he's not, the whole world disappears except for that target right over there. All he's looking at is this thing that's about the size of an apple. The rest of the world, it just, the world disappeared. That is what he's talking about. We have to focus on exactly what we are aiming at. I'm, I'm just imagining some different individuals walking through the room. And one of the believers has my video on. And the believer is sitting there listening to this video. Or doing their duties with the video running so they can hear it. And somebody walks through the room that's not a believer. That's a, a stranger to the covenant. A strangeling, maybe. That word came to me. They're a strangeling. Look that word up in the dictionary. Watch out. Watch that. Watch that. A strangeling walks through the room when my video's on. And they look over at that, and they listen to that. I noticed that the Lord uses my voice to reach out to uh, more and more, and commonly, to reach out to ones that are not being spoken to in their normal daily routine affairs that it's, it's taking voices like mine that are saying it the way I'm saying it from the angle so to speak that I'm saying it to reach people that are not being reached in normal circles in their normal daily goings in and goings out there's an anointing for that Hey, not everybody gets to walk in that. So those of those of you that are, you know, what I call repetitious Christians that are in situations, you should be getting into, you know, stronger teaching, etc. And and uh, more Oh, no, no, what's that word, Lord? God help me out.
Nama mana 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 nak kata tu begitu, kaya 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 kaya, nama mana mana nak kata. Oh, I didn't want to talk about this. We went to a church for about ten years, and uh, I'm gonna I'm going to mention some things, and I'm going to mention that these things in the spirit of observation, and I'm going to say not in the spirit of criticism, but in the spirit of observation, that I saw these things happen, and not wanting to be critical at the time or now, you know, I'd have to go to God and say, uh, straighten this out in my thinking, how, sort, help me sort this out, because there's some things going on here that are not, that's not the way you would have it done. Watch the Holy Spirit get me out of this one, people. <laughs> Jesus, you know, Jesus, this is a side issue or side side plate here. Jesus taps me to delve into things that other people won't touch. And it takes some Holy Spirit threading my way through things sometimes to come out the other end of the pipe looking good. And as I always pray before I do a video, without sticking my shoe in my mouth. Well, we went to this place for about 10 years, this church. And... Um, I would prepare myself all week long for the Sunday service. I wasn't preaching. I, I was just a member. And I would prepare myself listening to tapes, praying into the Word, praying in English a lot, praying in tongues a lot, and everything else in the whole circle of, of those things. And... Long before Sunday, the next Sunday came around, I was so pumped in the Word. And this went on for 10 years. And I was so pumped in the Word, I'd get there. And after, you know, uh, a couple, three, a few years, noticed that... You know, I'd be so pumped in the things of God that somewhere between Sunday... And the next Sunday, the Lord would give me what seemed like 85% of whatever was going to be preached on that coming Sunday. I would sit down in that service, at the beginning of that service, and I knew before that guy opened his mouth, I knew 85% of what he was going to say. I already knew it. And as time went by, some things went awry in the place. And one of the things that, that really displeased me, and I sensed it was uh, displeasing the Holy Spirit in me that was going on. Well, here it, here it goes. Well, it occurred to me over the years, and you know, they had their habits. They had their churchy, churchy habits in this place. Remember that there's a scripture that says, your religious traditions have made the word of God of no effect. Your religious traditions, you know, with, with all your uh, gaudy, G-A-U, Gotti, fancy fanfare, smoke and mirrors, skinny jeans, uh, etc., have made the word of God of no effect. So I'd get there, we'd get there. There was there was a number of us that we'd clued into this and didn't know what to do. We, we prayed over it continuously, continuously, continuously. And was just having done all the stand, standing. And you know, you get there, 
expecting, believing for the Holy Spirit to move, you're pumped. You know, I'm pumped. I'm sitting there and I'm pumped. I'm ready for God to show up and, you know, blow this place up and put it back together supernaturally or something. And so they'd start the singing service and the worship service. And sometimes it went really well. The singing and the worship service, it went well. There was the worship that was going on. You realized that we had brought the presence of God into the place. There was no question about that at all. And that would go along and go along and go along. And personally, I sensed um, we should keep going. We should not stop this for any reason, unless it's the Holy Spirit. And many times, right about that, right about that point there, some jughead would open his mouth and start talking something that was totally inappropriate. And the presence of the Holy Spirit just went whoosh, gone. Bye-bye. See you next time. And saw that year after year. Now, that's it, it, some people will agree with me. That's about enough to make some people puke. All the effort that we put into our week leading up to that service, seeing that happen week after week after week, I will not put up with that trash. That is garbage. That's first cousin that don't ever sing a song of unbelief in my presence because I'll call you on it. Don't do it around me. And you know, oh dear God. So the song service is, uh, and the worship service is going along, and somebody will start talking, completely smash the atmosphere, or some non-genius turns it all down, turns it all down, the worship all down, turns it all down, 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 down and pulls the sheet of paper out from underneath the, uh, the podium or beside the podium and, and stops what was going on. To start making announcements. What is the definition of stupid? Somebody say, Brother Randy, you get worked up about that. Yeah, you're right. And so does the Holy Ghost. He's a lot more polite than me. And you can thank God that he uh, has a lot more self-restraint. That he doesn't say... Hey, you morons! Just imagine if God calls somebody morons. You know what they're headed for, because he just said it. God is so merciful when it comes to collateral damage. Yes, I've actually got notes on what I'm doing now. You know, if you got, I understand about announcements. Get yourself a bulletin board. Put it out in the foyer. You know, typically a lot of places open up with song one way or another. Worship, whatever, song, some way. But, and I understand that. But, you know, when you've got invested the time and the effort and everything that's involved, all the wherewithal that's involved in the, in the song of things and in, in God. You got all that invested. Don't throw it away by somebody smashing the atmosphere. God works in atmospheres. Surely you've got that figured out by now. God works in atmospheres. You know, if you're going to open up with the music, go ahead and open up with the music. Whatever flow the Holy Spirit starts running in, flowing in, walking in, pay very close attention to that. If he says to zig, zig. If he says to zag, then you zag. Don't waste that atmosphere that has been created there. Um, consider this, preachers. Consider the ones that are sitting there in that congregation that we've invested a lot in this service. Don't squander 
what has been invested in that service by people in the spirit. Don't squander, you know, like in a race, don't squander your lead. Don't squander that thing. That atmosphere has been created and paid for in the spirit by people. Don't ruin that. Don't throw that away. And to the ones that need to hear this, if you think I'm railing on you, you're right. You know, consider doing your offerings at the end if it doesn't, you know, smash the presence of God. Or, <coughs> like I said, have a bulletin board out front. Tell the people, um, you don't have to tell the people. You can point at the bulletin board when they come in. Tell them when they come in. Tell them when they leave. You know, this thing about throwing away the anointing like that. Don't do that around me, sweetheart. Don't do that around me. I'm a really good investor. I know where to invest for profit. I'm a very anointed investor. And I invest heavily in the presence of God. And the dividends show up. That's called the presence of God. That's the dividend. The Lord's leaning on me again to talk about collateral damage. I was just out for a short drive with my wife, and I said to her, right out of the blue, I said, The Lord is... He's really leaning on me to keep talking up this, the understanding of, from his point of view, of collateral damage. And as I said in previous video, Supernaturally, Father God, help me supernaturally to, to explain this. Cause the eyes of their understanding, Daddy, to be enlightened concerning your movings concerning collateral damage. One of the things that I saw is this. There are people that are in positions of power And I'm, I'm getting a sense that many of them, they've had the biscuits, as we say. Or you'd say, their goose is cooked. Not everybody's going to go to heaven. Not everybody. Not everybody's going to go to heaven. And as God removes one by one, two by two, ten by ten, ten thousand by ten thousand, or whatever it is. The evil ones. It is being done in the interest of collateral damage. God does not want the good guys damaged. The bad guys have already set themselves up, queued themselves up for a fall. There was this guy in the Old Testament in Moses' days. And this guy, when they were, uh, they'd come out of Egypt. And this guy was always bugging Moses. You know, railing on Moses. Oh, Moses, you're not doing this right. You're not doing that right. You should be doing it this way. And there came a point where this guy's name was Dathan. I wouldn't name a dog Dathan today.
and Dathan had, uh, he'd come to the end of his string. He wasn't, uh, he was no longer useful. And Moses had had it. And he said, okay, those that are on the Lord's side, come over here. So everybody that was on the Lord's side, they went to this one spot. And when everybody had moved to where Moses said, everybody that's on the Lord's side, move over there, you know. And when everybody had accomplished that, it was done. The earth, E-A-R-T-H, the earth where Dathan and his too much mouth crowd were, the earth opened up and swallowed that crowd. Okay? And then the word says, and then it closed. I'd like to know what that Hebrew word there for closed is. I'd like to know the Hebrew word, and I'll tell you why. I was meditating on that. In the part there where it says, the earth opened up and then it closed. I can't prove this. But my impression was, when the earth closed up, after it had swallowed them, as that's what the word says, it says it swallowed them. That when the earth closed, for some reason, I have a, I, I'm going to call it an intuitive thought that says, that when that when the earth closed back together, there was no, you know, like a crack in the earth, like an earthquake crack. I just got the impression that when the earth closed up, it closed up as it was before it cracked open. No seam, no stitches, no scar. It's as though those people that it swallowed never existed. That's my intuitive hunch on what happened there. Tope bebar mana da koshiki to the kika mama mana da kasta ka de kika to die. Talk to me, Daddy, about talk to the people here about collateral. What you have to say about collateral damage? Mo na mana na bara bara de kiko to toi mama na da kisto. Strab drab ko koi ma shting ski ta koi mama na bara da kata da kiko i mama mara da kasta. No more than a man under the catric cook, coim, a man about the catric cook, or eat the catric 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 to change their ways and to know that when you afflict the body of Christ, you are personally offending Jesus. Jesus Christ takes it personally. It's a personal offense to him and against him, when you touch in a harmful way the body of Christ. Get a load of this. Jesus says to you, don't touch my church. Don't touch my church. Don't touch my church. So there's this guy in the Old Testament. And he's, uh, well, I don't even want to give that guy much focus and press here. So this guy, is he a king? Yeah. And he's irritated, shall we say, that that 
there's a, a prophet in the land. His name is Elisha. He's God's man. And uh, the king doesn't like some of the things that Elisha, God's man, is doing. Uh, verse 31. I've got to jump in somewhere. Then he said, this is the king. God do so, and more also to me, if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, shall stand on him this day. In other words, he plans on killing him today. Not, not tomorrow, today. But Elisha sat in his house, and the elders sat with him. And the king sent a man from before himself. But ere the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, See ye how this son of a murderer... Now, I can think of other son of uh, descriptions that, that we might use. See, this is Elisha speaking. He says, See ye how this son of a murderer has sent to take away my head? This son of a murderer has sent a hitman to get me. This son of a murderer. Talking about uh, the king. The head politician. Look how this son of a murderer has sent a hitman for me. Let's talk, let's talk plain here people look at look how this son of a murderer this son of a murderer has sent a hitman to kill me this son of a murderer 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 satan is the murderer he's come to steal kill destroy Kill, murder. He says, this son of a murderer. Call the guy what he is. He's a son of a murderer. He's a son of the devil. Elisha says, see how this son of a murderer has sent to take away my head. Hear well, evil politicians. Hear well. Are you a son of a murderer? Are you cooperating, son of a murderer? Is that what you are? Are you cooperating with the enemy in being a son of a murderer? Take stock of yourself. Judge yourself. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Take stock of yourself. Get a hold of yourself. Come to yourself. change tracks a little bit. When this video is being prepared, the Detroit Auto Show is on. Detroit, if you've never looked into the history of Detroit, what makes Detroit tick? What, are the, what did it come from? How did that get started, Detroit? Well, Henry Ford, Ford Motor Company, Henry Ford... He started building what would be vehicles in the garage behind the house. And, of course, it's, it's grown to an enormous thing today. In the interest of keeping this story short,
before before that car company came along of course there was manufacturing things going on various places in the world but when Ford came along and he did what he did my understanding of, of manufacturing history is that manufacturing was pretty scattered and when Ford came along help me to say this right Lord he sort of like a cowboy does he sort of threw a loop around things and started bringing a bunch of things together and things started to get bigger and grow and grow and grow if you ever look at the the history of what happened with Detroit you will I'm guessing you're going to be really surprised at how much Detroit has to do with the success of the entire world the enterprise that grew out of Detroit there was nothing like that on the earth up till then and Detroit became the manufacturing center in the heart of how would you say that the industrial Detroit became the industrial heart you know like everybody has a heart that heart pumping in your chest Detroit became the industrial machine heart of the world that's how big Detroit was that's what happened in Detroit it became that big there was nothing on the planet like Detroit uh, I think of the word massive it's massive what happened because of Detroit Detroit affected the entire world the entire world the whole world Detroit affected the world and I saw a commercial uh, promo for the uh, auto show and there was uh, a lot of young people and they had built cars to put into the show and it was it was remarkable to see these youngsters you know oh I suppose 16 years old and up and how they had built these cars for the show and what a they show the workmanship in these cars and these cars were really remarkable and I've been really privileged to be around some people that are world-class restorers so I've had opportunity to see about restoring and to and to look at it and it was remarkable some of these um, things that these young people produced these cars that they built absolutely just you might say stunningly beautiful <laughs> the, the job that they did and they the polish and the what we call spit and shine you know and the chrome and everything uh, of, of the efforts that they put in these these cars these old cars some new some very very modernistic uh, some of them even uh, what's that word uh, futuristic there's another word but anyway very very well done just just absolutely well done remarkable in the true sense of the word so the spirit there is still a spirit in Detroit that still lives and you know if you've ever been around Detroit the Motor City there's something about the Motor City it has its own spirit there's they showed in this promo they showed old cars and they showed some old bikes and modern bikes motorcycles and you know you get around uh, you get around American made cars trucks and motorcycles American made stuff it has its own spirit I've been around seems to be everything that's out there and the American made stuff there's just something down home and apple pie about it it's it's got its its own spirit it's very American 
and that's a good thing. I'm saying that from a good standpoint. Anybody that hears this video from the Motor City and the surrounding area, I, you know, I, I'm saying these words as words of encouragement to you. And it makes me curious. I'm not going to prophesy over this. It makes me curious. What does the Lord have in store? Now, here's an observation that I have made. For example, we found out over the course of time, and it has been prophesied by people saying that where revivals started, they will break out again. For example, Coffeyville, Kansas, Azusa Street, uh, Los Angeles, and there's more. So we know that, that revival will break out again where it once was. And that makes me curious. Lord, are you going to do something where Detroit is concerned? Uh, I don't remember that as a, as a revival center, but... Um, I do know it as a, uh, a birthplace of new things. So I'm asking the question, you know, in the presence of God, are you going to do something really spectacular about Detroit? Because we know the negative things and the draining that's taken, has taken place in Detroit it's a curiosity to know, is God going to revive that place? Will it ever come back to its original grandeur? Because I'm just tickling the surface in my description of Detroit. You look into, read up, read up on it a little bit about Detroit. I'm telling you, you will be surprised. You, will, you may say to yourself, I have never imagined that Detroit was ever anything like this. It was, it was the massive heart, ba-boom, 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 of the world. It was the manufacturing heart of the planet Earth. Glory to God. So God bless Detroit, the Motor City. Nam shama mama na mana na ka te de kika ke a pi varia to kostas. Nom shama mama na mana na ka te de kika ke a mana bara bata da kosta. Nom shama mama na bara bata de kita de kika ke a mana bara bata da kata da. It's a little bit off topic, but I'm going to go here. Maybe it's not off topic. In Canada, right across the river from Detroit, the Detroit River separates Detroit from Windsor, Ontario. And Windsor is also called the Motor City because there's car plants and engine plants, etc. in Windsor, lots of them. And uh, oh, back in the, I think it's the early 70s, there was a radio station that came into being when I was a, a young teenager. And this radio station that came into being, Lord, help me, help me to lay this out like a blueprint. This radio station that came into being, it grew and it became the most powerful AM radio station in North America. Not the most powerful radio station, FM, or excuse me, AM, not the most powerful in Canada, not the most powerful in North America, or excuse me, uh, United States, but the most powerful AM station in North America. Their signal was so strong, this is the early 70s, their signal was so strong, they picked up CKLW radio station in South Texas. So they weren't broadcasting to a, a local audience. They were big stuff. <laughs> There's a bunch of backstory to this. I've heard myself. Uh, I've heard music. Uh, artists, singers, recorders, 
and they talked about CKLW. And amongst themselves, they would say back in the day, if you can get play on CKLW, you've got her made. It would be, you know, sort of like somebody that gets to be on Dick Clark or Ed Sullivan. Get on that show, oh, you're, you're away, man. You, you got it. And I heard lots of them talk about if they could get play on that. I could name you off probably at least seven, maybe ten singers interviewed on a documentary that said that and explained that. And they would say, if you, if you could, how did they phrase that? They're, uh, you might call her the program director. That might not be the correct name. But she was the one that decided what records got played. And her name I think she's gone now, but her name was Rosalie. And the scuttlebutt, scuttlebutt amongst the crowd was, if you can make contact with Rosalie, you got her made. Her name was golden in the trade. If, if, you, if you could make contact with her, um, you were cooking. One guy, I don't know if he did this right during during that time zone or a little bit later, but he wrote a song. And the name of the song is Rosalie. You listen to the lyrics? And he's singing to Rosalie, oh, you know, something, I'm making this up. But, oh, Rosalie, you know, you know uh, you're the best, and if, if we can just... You know, da 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 da, and, and get a, get the play going, and you know the the get on get some airtime, and he sings on. It's a whole song that's made. It's dedicated to her and the story of her. I mean, how many program directors do you have you ever heard of in the world that they had songs written about them by the most famous people? And you know, if if you know anything about um, the Detroit area and the surrounding area, there has been enormous music um, talent come out of that area. Now, they were on, I wouldn't say they're on the Christian side of things, but I'm just remarking on history. So this radio station, I'm telling you, I know that when I was growing up, teenage, young teenager, there was only one, there's only one station you listened to. You didn't listen to the local cities around where I was. You didn't listen to any of that. That stuff was, we called that Bogue, short, short for bogus. <laughs> that stuff was junk. We listened to Radio 80. Man, that was, that was, that was the happening place. Radio 80 was just as good as underground FM stations and and better than most of, of any of them. I'm telling you it was it was the place. Everybody listened to that radio station. Everybody. Well let's see let's see where I go with this. Glory to Jesus forevermore. Well Somebody in Canada started whining. No, no, I'm not going to say that. No, they started bitching about too much American content on the airwaves in Canada. And these slobs, they actually pushed it into being and they pushed that radio station into playing Canadian content almost almost completely exclusively 
Now, I can tell you as a teenager growing up in that time, having been used to what was being played on that radio station, when this Canadian content came on, it was garbage, okay? They were promoting this group, that group, that group, da 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 and it was junk. Big capital J, junk. In my crowd that we ran with, everybody looked at it and said, they have absolutely destroyed that radio station. When they did that, just imagine this, because this is actually what happened. I was there back in the day. One day, they were playing the most, the most hippest music, the most current stuff, and the next day, a legal decree fell like a guillotine. And that station completely changed their content. And when they changed their content, it was garbage with a big capital G. There was a, uh, there was a uh, local television station within an hour or two of here in Canada. And they got a lot of their movie content from the BBC. And uh, we learned real quick that if it came from the BBC, oh, that stuff was pretty dry. Okay. And I'm being generous. What I really want to say is it was junk. The stuff that came out of England, the movies and stuff that came out of England, Oh, I can hear Uncle Jed on the hillbilly saying, pitiful, pitiful. That's what that was. Isn't it interesting? And and the vast majority of the stuff that was ble being played on that radio station I'm talking about, it was from the st all from the States. It was all the hippest, the most, uh, you know, current, what's happening stuff. I'm just quoting history. I'm not, I'm not falling in line with uh, that style of music. I'm just quoting history. And, you know, you take a look at, the American uh, movie industry. Well, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that the American movie industry over the decades from the word go, it's the best on the planet. There's nothing like that. Nobody puts out that quality of stuff. Now, I have to, I have to draw a distinction when I say that because some of you usually be going, oh my God, is Brother Randy, uh, has he gone over to the, you know, uh, like it? No, 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 no. Listen, I can talk about a movie and, and I can say it like this. That movie, and I'll make one up. That movie that was just made, it was really, really, um, you could say it was done well, but it was done wrong. There was no moral content, but as far as the, you know what I'm saying, the, the construction of the movie, um, the whole structure of the movie you can see it was very well done it was done properly as far as technically goes and they they hired the right people it was cast properly and all that but the storyline was dark this about it was wrong 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 but it's like a manufactured car it was it was built well but it's just there's something wrong and that's, that's been the, the case of Hollywood. Hollywood had, has had lots of opportunities to get it right. And on some occasions, they've got it right. Just imagine with the capability that Hollywood has today, the movie industry has today. Just imagine with the capabilities, with all the special effects and everything that exists in that business today, what they could do for God if they made things properly. You know, there's a difference between, you know, oh, tell you what it reminds me of. My wife can make pastries. Fabulous. I've gone to places where they have pastries for sale there. I've been in places that locally to them, and even famously,
people will say, that place is one of the best pastry places in the world. So I'm not a pastry freak, but because I know what pastries are from being around a good chef, I went there to see, this is curious. Everybody says this place, it's number one. And when I went into that place, brother, sister, I'll tell you this, that it was a pastry place and it was a pastry place. They had everything in there, more than enough of variety, everything, everything, quantity, everything. It was, it was a remarkable place. Now watch this. The pastries that they had in there, they were gorgeous to look at. I'm talking beautiful. Whoever runs this place, um, they've got that part figured out. But I know what it's like to live with somebody that can and does make pastries that are absolutely gorgeous. Gorgeous. Big capital G, gorgeous. And the taste, when people taste her stuff, they say things like, I've never ate anything like this in my life. And these are people that are in their uh, later years. They've got lots of experience. Never, never, never seen anything like this before. Never tasted it. I shouldn't maybe say this, but um, we've had people come out to our place. I can think of three single men that came to our place over the decades and sat at the supper table with us and ate and within 15 minutes had to run out the back door and go to the rail on the deck outside and lose their supper. They ate and ate and ate and ate and ate. They'd never seen food like this. And they ate themselves till they lost their they lost their supper over the rail. Couldn't control themselves. They was beyond. Like I, I never, you know, they're saying I never seen anything like this. Never seen like this. So getting back to this beautiful pastry stuff. So I went in there, and I looked at it, and I think I I bought two of the things to sample them. And it was exactly, it was exactly what I thought. The stuff was absolutely gorgeous to look at, tasteless. Threw it out of the threw it out threw it out the window. <laughs> threw it out the window. Scrapped it. Walking down the street, took a bite, went over to the uh, garbage can on the side of the street, put it right in the garbage can. Done. Gone. Wouldn't touch it. That stuff, it's fake. Like fake news, fake pastry. Looks beautiful, but it's just, ugh. Nothing to it. Wow, those are different places to go today. Praise God. One of the reasons I mentioned that about the radio station and the decree, a decree, a government decree came down, boom, you're out of business. You're not going to play any more American content. You're going to play something like, it was nuts, 95% Canadian content. Well, the Canadian artists were junk. Oh, I know that's going to rattle some people. Rub the mad spot. Maybe it'll go away. It's Music is like food. You know what you like. Either you like it or you don't like it. Okay? And we found out back then, then in those days, oh, that stuff, I'm telling you. Oh, it was, it, was, it was a shock to see that happen. It reminds me of, of in the Bible where... Um, Haman, the guy that got hanged, you know, the guy that got hanged because he wanted to kill all the Jews. Well, what Haman did was he went to the king and he suckered the king into having this decree, this written document, which, yes, you can look in your Bible, read further on what I'm talking to you about, about Haman, and you will see that the actual language you is is a legal term that they use in the courts and the and lawyers today. The king had this decree written up, and the decree in the Bible it's called an instrument. Many of you never knew that before. A legal writing is actually referred to as an instrument 
you know, there's instruments like a trumpet, da -da 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 -da. but in this case, it's referred to as a legal instrument. <coughs> and the king had Haman suckered the king into making up this legal document instrument, and he got permission to enforce it, just like on the radio station. Some, some self-serving people, they, uh, they wanted it, the content to go Canadian, and uh, which was substandard according to everything else that's going on in the world. And uh, they pulled it off. At the time, we said, un we said it's almost unbelievable. Couldn't believe our eyes. That was one of the beginnings of the erosion of free speech. Oh, some light bulbs went on there, didn't it? You can, I've had time to consider this. Now you take the time to consider this. They wanted the words. They wanted to be able to control more the words. Lyrics are words. Okay. Even, even the tone in the sounds and music, that is a persuader. Don't try and tell me it's not. It is a persuader. Oh, a lot of light bulbs going on today. Praise God. Praise God forevermore. Get in my meetings. Get in my wife's meetings. Get in our meetings. Get in the presence of the man of God. Get in the presence of the Holy Spirit where he's working. You can get so much on a video, you can get so much on a CD. Nothing is the same as sitting in the presence of God. Make contact with the presence of God. Well, I think that's enough for today. Thanks for listening. See you next time.